Next, how a spy project evolved into today's modern hot air balloon. Great ideas must, of course, come from somewhere. History books tell us the birth of ballooning is credited to Joseph and Jacques Montgolfier. These Frenchmen, in 1783, sent three farm animals skyward in the very first recorded balloon ascension. But it was a young American, who now lives in New Mexico, who took that 18th century invention, applied modern technology, and created what we now know as the hot air balloon. The first flight was pretty miserable because we were burning vapor and I was shaking the tanks and trying to make it vaporize faster. And that was, uh, I think, 10th of October. A bold pilot, a handsome man with striking features. And today, 33 years later, a man who is aged 70 something is very generous in granting a rare television <laughs> interview. A man who some told me was a bit difficult, perhaps unapproachable, is anything but that. Ed Yost is his name, on, and he is the father of modern hot air ballooning. His collection of clippings and photos is immense. Yeah, about 50 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, uh, this is Barnes' first balloon. <laughs> I made 87,000 cargo shoots for Vietnam. Everybody hated the bear grab, but if you want to see who can fly a balloon, this is the only way you do it. Balloons are a pretty safe machine. It's what you do with it. What's your favorite memory out of all this? I don't this have any. Book. They're all favorite. This is the most fun ever. <laughs> Leaf through this the pages, it becomes abundantly clear that without the efforts of a few yeah. men, like Ed Yost, ballooning as we know we it Kentucky, likely would not be. When did you first get involved in uh, balloons? Um, about 1949, 48, in there someplace. How did it happen? Well, it was, uh, actually, I got involved. I, I bought an AT-19, which is a surplus military airplane made for England, and um, the war was finished before the airplanes were put in service, and they shipped them back. I am down in Norfolk, Virginia. I bought two of them, one for spare parts. And when the Navy started the Skyhook balloon program to study radiation, cosmic rays, and so forth, so I leased them the airplane and to follow the balloons with them. I've been in balloons ever since and just migrated from the airplane business into the balloon business. <laughs> uh, when was the first time you flew in a balloon? Oh, in 1949 or 50. I started training people at that time in helium balloons. What were the circumstances? We don't talk about that. Okay. It is still classified by the government, but it's written that Yost's company, General Mills, was working on high-altitude gas balloons for scientific and probably espionage projects. Now, one of those jobs involved dropping leaflets behind the Iron Curtain, and it was Yost who developed a mechanism to do just that. It was only a matter of time before U.S. agents needed a silent way to drop a man into enemy territory. Yost and three others went to work. I made a 10-foot plastic balloon and I had a plumber's fire pot that I heated my airplane engine with and I put that on this 10-foot balloon I got some buoyancy out of it not very much but anyway they don't made a 30-foot plastic balloon but I took the pictures and I went uh, back to Washington to the Office of Naval Research and I got a grant of 47,000 bucks to continue the work and it, we did this five years before we made our actual free flight. It was Yost who strapped himself to a plywood board, equipped with two small propane fuel cells and a burner, and sailed off into the unknown. You had a sneaking suspicion that uh, there wasn't going to be anybody else who'd be the first person to go up in it, didn't you? Well, you oh, I didn't hear of any volunteers. <laughs> <laughs> Ballooning soon caught on. And eventually, people would decide to challenge themselves and their aircraft. From 1955 until 1978, 13 attempts were made to cross the Atlantic by balloon. Five people lost their lives trying. Ultimately, a balloon built by Ed Yost, piloted by three men from Albuquerque, would succeed in beating the ocean. Maxie Anderson, Ben Abruzzo, and Larry Newman would go down in history books. But Yost has his place as well. In 1976, Yost's Silver Fox would set a record, which stands to this day. I was near four and a half days solo flight. My flight went 2,400 
75 miles farther than Los Angeles, New York. Still, it was Ed Yost, the man behind the scenes, who guaranteed the success of the Atlantic crossing and several historic flights which followed. What kind of sense of accomplishment did you get from watching those who followed you with your knowledge well, of technology? Funny. Um, you pick out the size balloon you think they should use. You took these people to Amarillo, Texas and teach them all. My dad used to say, I taught you all I know and still you don't know anything. But we tried to teach them uh, how to fly helium balloons and build the whole thing, launch the balloon. And, God, I hate to say this, you know, uh, after the whole mission is accomplished and stuff, you never hear from them again. Any of them. Never? Never. Well, when they want something else. As Yost now tells it, the 1978 flight of the Double Eagle II, the first crossing in the Atlantic, saw Yost with much more than just a passing interest. You see, not only was he the builder of the balloon, he owned it all the way across the ocean. He mistakenly was not paid before the flight. When you think of how much effort, thought, work, labor, sweat, blood, and tears has gone into bringing the Science Air Station to where it is, you're kind of disappointed, guy, to think that it might not go a hell of a lot further? It's disgusting. Obviously, Ed Yost is not particularly happy with what has happened to the science that he helped pioneer. He produced a book for us to inspect, the product of five years' work, all the things that he wanted to know before making his first flight. He is sorry to see that, in his opinion, little has happened since then. Flying a balloon, flying a balloon is exactly like somebody with a camera, isn't it? They take two rolls of film and they're an expert. And it's somewhat disgusting, but you see, People buy a fancy balloon, spend a lot of money, buy fancy clothes and all this stuff, and all of a sudden everybody's a dang expert again. And they forget that this is an art of aerostation. And a it's science. a science. And there are Not just a lot of things going on, and a lot of things can be improved on, but the big improvement now is put more padding on here and make this cuter and paint a picture on it. What a hell of a deal, I don't care. What Yost does care about is attention to detail. For example, the log home he and his wife built in the mountains of northern New Mexico. This balloon launch field, it used to be a boulder field. Look now at the firewood, it's all very carefully stacked. You see it in Ed Yost's sky power balloon baskets, each carefully woven by hand. My dad used to say, everything you make, make it look like it came out of a factory. <laughs> he, wouldn't, he wouldn't stand for anything cobbled up. Yost certainly led the way. Now we wonder, is there anyone filling his shoes? Well, I don't know. A lot of people trying, I guess. Anyone that you admire? I don't even know him. Oh, they do know him. In fact, each and every pilot should remember that part of Ed Yost is along on each and every flight.